Hi, this is Josh Nelson and I'm the CEO of Infinite Wealth Strategist and I am proud to announce that we are finally launching our Intelligent Banker podcast. This all started a few years ago when my wife and I were very successful in network marketing. We were making six figures a month and I'll tell you guys what happened. We decided that we wanted to retire for a little bit because that's what you do when you make a lot of money, right? And unfortunately, as we started spending our money, our money started going down and we had a bunch of cool stuff, but I was basically just broke at a high level now and I was very confused. And I went on a mission because I did what my parents taught me to do. I went to school, I got good grades. Now I didn't finish school, I went and got my GED. And then I started making you know, $20, $30 an hour. I got involved in this thing called network marketing. And at a very young age, I exploded. Um, I had teams in nine different countries all over the world and we were making a lot of money, had a place in Hawaii, was traveling. I mean, I've been to almost all the different countries that are out there. And what happened was, is we went broke. We had all this nice stuff, but we went broke. And I'll tell you guys what I realized is that nobody taught me about finance. Nobody taught me what to do with money. I was really good at making it but I, and spending it obviously, but I didn't know, I didn't have any kind of a financial plan because they don't teach that stuff in school. So lo and behold, we started this company called Infinite Wealth Strategist about three and a half years ago. And we started with a concept called infinite banking. Now I'm not going to go into that here because I want you guys to like and subscribe to this video so that you can join and be involved in our podcast. But what I will tell you is that our financial system is rigged and it's rigged against you. Imagine going to a country and playing a sport and not knowing the rules. And imagine you went on the field. Wouldn't you agree that you would have a disadvantage and that there's no way that you're going to win the game, right? Because you don't know the rules to the game. That is the way the financial system has been rigged against you. When you were born, you got a social security number and a birth certificate, and that put you into a system that you didn't even opt into. And now when you go get a bank account, you use your social. Every time you get a loan, you use your social. You apply for credit. You're using that social. That social is putting you into what I call the rigged system. Now, I have a book, my first book, called Unveiling the Secret to the Rich, which you can pick up on Amazon that walks you through exactly how the system is rigged against you. The reason that we started this podcast is because right now the economy is in turmoil, inflation is out of control, and the feds are starting to hike interest rates. It's inevitable that families learn financial education. And I'm telling you guys that by design, this has been taken out of schools so that the system will be rigged against you. Folks, the whole purpose of this podcast is to teach you our financial strategies. Now, we have strategies that will legally put you in a position where you will be lawsuit proof, you will be judgment proof, and you will be able to not pay capital gains legally. Now, I'm not going to show you any way to commit fraud or do anything illegal, and I will tell you that our strategies hold up in the Supreme Court. I want you to join the Intelligent Maker podcast because it is going to be a fun journey together. We have a lot of information that we're going to be sharing. And the best part is we don't charge anything. Folks, there's people out there that are teaching financial strategies that are charging tens of thousands of dollars for you to even get in the room or to even be a fly on the wall. And here at the Intelligent Maker podcast, we are going to be giving you guys the financial strategies that only the elite use the strategies that the elite does not want you to know and the strategies that once you implement these into your family, you're going to create your own family economy, you're going to have your own family bank, and you'll never pay interest to a third-party bank ever again. Folks, I'm telling you now is the time that you learn and that you get financially educated. So again, I'm Josh Nelson. I'm the author of The Intelligent Banker, and I'm excited to welcome you guys to The Intelligent Banker podcast. Like and subscribe this video so that when we launch our first show next week, you're the first to get it. Take care and we'll see you guys at the top. All right, so Craig, as our senior trust strategist, I just wanna kinda of go over some of the things that people need to know before they actually fill out the application. Cause you know, the trust can be a little complex when you look at it. You've got your settler, you've got your trustee, you've got your uh, trust guardian. Um, you know, all these different roles of the trust, I wanna make sure that people really understand how to fill out the application. So when it comes to the app, um, the agent that they're working with is gonna send it to them. 
they're going to click on a link. It's going to open up a form, right? Right. And the first thing that they're going to do is select a trust name. How important is that? And are there any do's and don'ts about choosing a name? Can they choose anything they want? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, first of all, I would just tell, you know, when I'm talking clients, I'm telling them at this point that I'm so excited for them. They made this decision. I mean, this trust to set this in motion is going to change their life, their mm -hmm. legacy for their family. It's going to become the foundation of their life and uh, in many ways. And so it's a really exciting time. And I congratulate people that uh, are at this point. So on the um, trust name, some things to think about is that you want to be thinking about a name that's unique, that means something to you, okay? Mm -hmm. This is an important instrument in your life, and you want it to be not tied to your family name, not tied to your business name. So, like, I wouldn't want to have it, like, <clears throat> Nelson Family Trust. No, you don't want to do that. Um, and is that because it's a non-grantor trust, right? Well, it's a non-grantor trust, and you want anonymity, okay? Mm -hmm. You do not want other people to know that it's your trust in that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is, is that this trust can have as many assumed business names as you want in it. So if you want to have something forward-facing about a business or whatever, do that with an assumed business name within the trust, but have the trust name you need. So the actual name of the trust would be more kind of something you would want to be anonymous, but if you're going to go have like a retail business or something, yes, you can go create a DBA that would be owned by the trust, Absolutely. and then you can operate forward facing with your business name that is correct and okay. so always be thinking of that and think about remember this trust is not just for a few years this trust is for generations and generations of people so think about a name that would be fitting for let's say three generations from you when they look at that name you know it would it wouldn't be offensive it wouldn't be something that wouldn't tie into what they're doing okay it's more general so I would, I would, I would give that advice to people. When so an example it. could be, because obviously I have a lot of trust clients. Right. Um, a lot of people will pick like a, like a scripture that means something to them, like Proverbs 311. Right, yeah. Spendthrift Trust or something right. like that. Yes. Okay, cool. What about the trust address? I know a lot of people ask about this because, you know, throughout people's life they move and things like that. And people think like, does this need to be a permanent address? But how important is it to choose an address and should this be their home address? Yeah, they just use their home address. Um, and just like uh, you, that address could be changed, okay? But uh, the address is gonna be given when you get an EIN number, you're typically gonna use your home address when you get the EIN number mm -hmm. uh, for you as the trustee. So you're gonna wanna just use your home address. Um, if you have a business trust, you could use the business address. The problem is, is that that can change a lot. They all can, but you can always change the address. But to start out with, I recommend people just What use about their, a PO box? No, you wanna use an address. Okay. So a physical address. address. Physical address, yeah. Okay. Um, what about county? I know that the application is going to ask for county. Yeah, there's a place on the there it's asking for, and some people are not quite clear what it's asking for, but what it's really looking for is the county you live in. So what's the name of the county that you, you live in? Okay. Now, when we get into trust roles, I know the first um, position of the trust is settler. Right. Who is that going to be, and how do they choose that? This is really important. We've got people have had, uh, you know, um, haven't thought this out well enough. So here's the important things about the settler is that the settler is just going to pay a temporary role in the trust. They're going to, their role is to set the trust up, initiate it, okay, mm -hmm. by signing a couple documents. They're going to appoint the, the trustee and the trust guardian, and then they're going to resign from the trust and never have anything to do with the trust, or can they ever have anything to do with the trust ever again? They never can be a beneficiary or trustee or So whatever. should the settler be their spouse? No. The settler cannot should it be, be their business member? partner? No. Their kids? No. no so it should be someone that is maybe a friend, but it should also be somebody that they're not doing a lot of business with or either, never right? Would, or never would have a reason to ever want to put them as a beneficiary or a trustee or have any role in the trust. I typically, it's just, an, it could be a neighbor, it could be a friend. Um, so I know anyway. a question that I get a lot is, could a settler be, let's say, a business partner that I do real estate deals with, but they're never going to actually have a role in my trust, meaning would, I'm never going to make them a beneficiary not, or a trustee. I, would, I wouldn't use them either because let's say you want to get a business trust down the road, okay, mm -hmm. and you want to do some, have them part of it. 
Um, there could be a, you know, I just, I don't want to limit myself, right? So, I mean, I'm going to pick somebody that absolutely positively there's not So, preferably a friend or a neighbor, someone yep. that you would probably not ever do a business with and that would never be involved in the trust absolutely. in any way. Another important thing is you want that person to live by you or be close by. Because okay. when you get that trust and you're going to go activate the trust, you need to have them with you in the trust book to get those pages notarized. Okay. Okay. And so you don't want somebody long ways away or out of state or whatever, because then you can't, you know, then it's a real hassle getting everything notarized mm -hmm. and you have to send, you know, FedEx pages back and forth and that. So pick somebody that's close by, somebody you know. Um, there's there's no risk or anything for them. All they're doing is sign some documents and they're not then releasing themselves, resigning from the trust and have nothing to do with it ever again. What about the, I know some people refer to it as a compliance officer. We refer to it as trust guardian. How do you choose that role and, and what is that? Absolutely. So the trust guardian is the most senior position in the trust. They are, um, they have control, the ultimate control of the trust. And typically the trust guardian is going to be the trustee or one of the trustees. So, you know, the, the main trustee, <coughs> you know, is, uh, who typically is going to be your trust guardian. Okay. What about initial trustee? <clears throat> the initial trustee would be that trustee. So let's say it would be, you know, one of the spouses or whatever, they would be the initial trustee. They typically would be the trust guardian. Um, so the trust guardian could also be the trustee. Absolutely. And you don't can, we typically <clears throat> recommend that too, when you first start yes. the trust, because whoever is going to kind of initialize <clears throat> this whole process, is going to have all the control in the beginning, right? And then down the road, if they want to do a, you know, appoint a different trust guardian, they could do that, right? So it's not like these are permanent choices right now. Yeah, the trust guardian is going to typically be there for, for a while. The trust guardian can appoint another trust guardian, and you, there are documents in the trust later where you can set up a successor trust guardian and a successor trustee, okay? Uh, so you can have uh, succession in the trust. It's advisable to do that. There's forms in the trust to sign <clears throat> and notarize for that effect. So it's now the a, trust guardian has more power than the trustee, <clears throat> correct? Yes, absolutely. So they can overthrow the trustee if the trustee is not doing, uh, if they're not managing the trust properly. The yes. trust guardian <clears throat> could fire them, they, appoint a new trustee. So it's important for. Yes people to know when they're filling out the application that the trust guardian is the highest position of authority, right? That is correct. And they can re they can um, add and remove beneficiaries. A trustee can add and remove beneficiaries as well, but the trust guardian has ultimate control. And so, yep. Now, a secondary trustee is also optional. That is optional. Um, and, and this is a very important thing to talk about. So. In this trust, again, because this trust is based on contract law, you can do a lot of things here you wouldn't be able to do in, in, in a legislative trust. Mm -hmm. In this trust, we can have um, both spouses, man and wife, okay, be trustees in the trust. And a lot of times that's advisable to do that. Because <clears throat> if you've got a business or, you know, say you're doing real estate investing mm -hmm. and that, right, and you're traveling and there's documents have to be signed or you've got checks that have to be signed and you're away, the only person who can sign checks and sign documents for the trust is a, is a trustee. And so it's very advisable at that point, especially if the spouse is working with you in the business to any degree, you know, to have them as a trustee as well. So that way, if you're out of town or whatever, they can execute those documents and take care of business. Now, a question I get asked a lot is that if there are two trustees, do both of them have to sign every check or can no, each no. one do things e on their e own? E on their own. And yeah. then again, the trust guardian could be the one managing all of that to make sure nobody's abusing power, exactly right. spending money they shouldn't be spending on, on things that are not a benefit to the trust that or the beneficiaries. Correct. Yep. Okay, cool. And you can still, even if you have two trustees, then you can still designate a successor trustee in the document so that maybe that's one of your oldest children right that are that are maybe older you know 21 years of age or 18 years sure. of age you know so if something happened to both of you it, you want to have the succession of the trust now what about beneficiaries <clears throat> I know this is an important topic because the whole purpose of the trust is for the beneficiaries yes. so who would those be and how do they choose those roles and do they have to <clears throat> choose them all now or can they add later? They can add later. They can choose some of them now and they can always add later. There's never no limit. You can always be adding trust uh, beneficiaries. The beneficiaries typically are going to be your children. 
Uh, but you know, there's some people who don't have any children, mm -hmm. and but they've got you know brothers and sisters. They got you know they have siblings. They have uh, nieces and nephews. So with this trust, you can uh, really appoint. You're not limited to who you can appoint no, as a beneficiary. No, not limited at all. I've got I've got clients that have got their you know they've added their parents as beneficiaries. A lot of them. So if um, I have no kids, mm -hmm. no spouse, I create a lot of wealth during my life, and I want to give it to a friend. I can I can appoint them as a beneficiary Absolutely. and their children if I want to pass yes. my legacy on that way. That is correct. That's another, powerful. Another powerful thing is that I'll give you an example. I've had clients that have had um, relatives that are disabled, um, or have um, you know a, a, a mental or health issue or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they can appoint them as beneficiary, and now the trust can bless them because the trust can expense all these other additional costs from medical and wellness and that to take care of those those people and the trust can expense all food and and fashion okay for so really for, it, for it, life it, for, so for it's really good to have many beneficiaries in yeah. your family because that creates more expenses for the trust well it does and um, but but you know a key thing is is that if you had someone you know let's say a niece or nephew or a brother or whatever that was disabled mm -hmm. um, you know the trust could problem, provide for them the trust can provide for them and it's a trust expense and wow. it can provide the food and clothing and everything for them for life it's not just until they're 21 it can be as long as they have that disability okay so it's a um, now what about the shipping address for the trust I know uh, people would say, why are they even talking about this? But I know um, they cannot ship to a P.O. box, right? So That's just right. really quick, can you address, while people are filling it out, where does the trust need to be shipped? You want to ship it to your house, typically. Where is that? Because it's going to be shipped second day FedEx, okay. right? And you want it to be, you know, it has to come to an address. You want to have it someplace where you're going to be, and you can receive the trust uh, there and uh, get start working on it. Okay, and then um, I know email address is obviously right. um, for communication. Exactly right. Um, how important is it to double, triple check your email address? Because I know the way we built our <clears throat> system, the way we prefer to communicate when someone activates a trust is we have a, a series of emails that go out, right? Yeah, and another, absolutely. And another reason for that is that when we apply for the EIN number for the client and, and get that, the IRS requires an email address mm -hmm. uh, on some of the forms, and they also require uh, a telephone number. And you require it because once we right. create the EIN exactly. number, you right. have to send it to the client, right? Yes, and they exactly. need that to activate the trust, to exactly. get the bank right. account and all that stuff set yes. up. Yep. And you actually <clears throat> create the EIN for the client, right? So yes, they don't have do. to worry about that. They don't have to do that. We create that for them. They'll have that EIN number typically before or at the same time they receive the trust book. Okay. And then I know they need to put a phone number. Um, we say preferably a cell phone number. Why yep. is that? Well, it's just because it's easier to reach somebody on that. Okay, right. and we can send text as well. Who has there. a landline these days? Right. right? I mean, I, I haven't had one in. I don't even. I, I, years, I haven't yeah. used a landline, yeah. and I don't even remember. How long. <laughs> Makes me feel old. <clears throat> You're right. Okay, so now we come to the point where they're going to sign and date. Um, that we've got payment options. Let's just talk about cashier's check, wire transfer. I know occasionally we can accept a credit card. It costs the client a little bit more money. Right. What would you, what do you recommend? Well, what most of our clients use wire transfer. Wire transfer. Same is, day. Same day. It's and quick. then we typically will ship the trust out the same day. Exactly right. So if we get that, if we receive payment, let's say on a wire transfer by, you know, typically three o'clock in the afternoon central time, we can typically get that trust book sent out that same day, mm -hmm. uh, the, the trust company, and it will come to you, you know, second day FedEx. So within two business days, you'll have the trust in your hands. Sure. Now, on the application, there is a section on there, um, and some people may not be getting one, but it talks about the business trust. Is that something they have to complete, or do they only can they yeah. skip that if they're not actually they can getting totally, They can totally skip that if they're not getting a business trust. It's only there to um, help for people they are going to also want at that same time purchase a business trust, and so it asks in there for like business social security number. and. That's another important part is that on the trust itself application, it asks for a social security number. You have to, the trustee has to provide the social security number. We need that to get the EIN number. Now, if, when they do set up the business trust, if they are getting one, right. the trustee and the trust guardian on the beneficial trust could also be on the business trust too, right? That in some correct. cases. That is correct. Yes, okay. it, could be, it, could be the, it could be the same 
um, could be a little bit different. Um, and also on a settler could be the same on the business trust as on the beneficiary trust. You could use the same person as a settler. So the questions on the business application are going to basically be what we just covered. Right. But now it's going to be from the perspective of who's going to be running and controlling the business right. trust. And then another thing on the business trust is that um, the beneficiary on the business trust will be your um, beneficial trust. So on the gotcha. business trust, you're going to make the beneficial trust the beneficiary. So you want the beneficiary of the, the business, business trust, trust to be the beneficial trust. That's correct. If they're getting both. That's correct. Awesome. <clears throat> And then the last thing is selecting a business trust name. Now, in this case, could the business name be the business trust name? It could, but I would recommend probably not doing that as well. Because, again, you're looking at an instrument that's going to last for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And you may run a lot of different businesses through there. Right. You know, if you take a look at um, a visual deal, you know, the Rockefellers use this trust. Last time, you know, we've heard on a book that was printed, they had over 350 family members of that trust and probably thousands of businesses, right? You right. know, I mean, investment deals in that. Probably and no one would even know what the original trust, trust name was. Name, exactly right, because they used a bunch of assumed business names. They probably got hundreds of assumed business names in that, in that same trust. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the year, for all that, it's just one 1041 exchange. That's uh, awesome. You know, filed, so. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure this video is going to really help people as they're filling out the application. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they're going to be excited. I mean, this is going to be a life-changing event for them and their family and the legacy they'll be able to leave. So we're so wrapping here. this up, let's just yeah. say I was a client and I just got my trust. What would be the first thing you would say to me? I Man, I'd say congratulations. And, you know, you what you've got your hands on here is something very unique that very that not very many people know about. And it's going to last so far beyond. Um, we've, we know families that have had these trusts set up since 1800s. And that same trust is serving all the legacy of their family since the early 1800s for 200 years. And That's it's, crazy. And all the assets have been protected. No probate, no inheritance tax, none of that, right? And then when the tax laws came in into in, in play, they um, added the verbiage to the trust to be compliant with I, IRC 643. So... They've never had to pay any passive income, capital gains, K-1 income, you know, for all those Powerful. Years. Powerful, yeah. I mean, So this just, form really is life-changing for people. It is absolutely life-changing. Absolutely, awesome. yeah. So. Well, thanks, Craig. You bet. All right, Craig. So now that we've gone through kind of how to fill out the application and all the roles of the trust, let's talk about, like, what, what the next steps are. The clients, get, and we talked about how important it is for them to provide an email. Yep. Right. A valid email that they're going to yes. actually receive the emails. And now we, we're going to talk about why. So they're they're first going to get an, uh, an email talking about the fact that we've received their application. Right. Right. Then the next email they're going to get is going to talk about the payment options. Yep. So why don't you talk about that? When that email comes, what what do they do at this point? You're right. So it's going to reiterate uh, the payment options that were on the application again about doing the wiring instructions and how to take and send a, a wire. Mm -hmm. Uh, to pay uh, for the trust, or they can use the cashier's check. Um, there if they want to do credit card, they need to let the agent know. That is correct. And then we would provide them with an invoice, With an right? invoice Separately. for the credit card. And uh, on credit card, we charge for the processing fee. Right. We have that, too, there. I recommend wire, and I think you do, it's, too. It's a, yeah, it's a cleaner deal. It's just yeah. it's, it's easy. <clears throat> All right, so after they pay for the trust, they're going to receive another email that says become the bank. Now I know we're all about Vortex banking. So, you know, I'm sure the agent at this point has already probably talked to them about Vortex being the whole life policy with the trust. They may or right. may not be getting the whole life policy, but this email is going to just really cover kind of how the policy interacts with the trust, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. That's correct. It's going okay. to show that how that how that works and the benefits of that. And really, I think that's the most important component. Once you have the trust, that's the one of the first things they should be doing is setting up that banking component. Absolutely. If you're putting money in the trust, you want the trust to be able to have a vehicle. To build wealth. To build wealth yep. and to ensure your income. So the next email they're going to get is once we actually receive the wire, the client is going to get notified, right, that they yep. that we've received the payment. Yep. Um, I know I would too, because it's <laughs> it's not a little bit amount of money, right? right. So they I would want to be notified. So uh, the client will be notified, and then they're gonna 
get a follow-up email right after that inviting them into our Live IWS Trust Training Program. That is correct. Which is five videos, right? That's right. Currently today, we've got five videos out there. Those five videos are going to take them through how to initialize, set up the trust. It's going to start covering the different types of assets and how you transfer by sale, mm -hmm. by bill of sale into the trust. And how that bill is it's going to give them access to the different forms, so the different types of bill of sale. Bill of sale for land and buildings, bill of sale for general um, you know, assets and uh, also for um, business assets. We have, you know, other forms as well, a bill of sale for uh, homes and uh, vehicles. So mm -hmm. now you're going to use those bill of sales, okay, to transfer, to sell those assets into the into the trust. And it goes through how to, how to fill those out, how to set it up and use those. How important is it for people, I can't even believe I'm saying this, because when people pay what they pay for the trust, right. it's amazing how many people don't have time. And, you know, we're all busy. Right. to watch the videos, right? How, how important is it to watch the videos? And for the clients that we know, because a lot of our clients are, are very busy, you know, these are guys that are, you know, flying around on their jets and things. Yeah, right, yeah. They could have their accountant or a bookkeeper or someone that's gonna help manage the trust watch the videos if they can't, right? It, it's right. important that someone watches the videos that's gonna be helping to manage and set up the trust, right? That is correct, and a lot of times it's themselves still. I mean, but you know, they're gonna to have to sign the documents and get them notarized, okay, for yep. doing it. So it's gonna be the trustee typically selling those assets into the trust. There are times when a beneficiary will have assets that they'll sell into the trust themselves and create a promissory note. So, but the key thing to understand here, I'll re reiterate, is that the foundation of this trust is that if an asset is not in the trust and owned by the trust, the trust cannot provide any asset protection whatsoever for it, and it cannot provide any tax benefit whatsoever for it. So to receive any tax benefit or asset protection, you have to have that, you have to sell that asset and the trust has to own that asset. So what you're saying is, is that if they want the benefits of the trust, right, they should watch these five videos. Absolutely. And take action, watch the videos and take action and sell your assets into the trust and get them into the trust. And those videos are so valuable because, I mean, and they're not long at all. I think they're 10 to 15 minutes yeah. each maybe. Yeah. Um, but to be able to learn to put the assets into the trust and gain that benefit is worth a hundredfold what they paid for the trust right away, right? Absolutely. So, So you would definitely want to watch those videos immediately. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, um, so I want to make sure the client knows how to get back into the training because I know this has been a, a challenge before. They need to save that email, right? They're going to receive an email with a link into that portal. That is correct. Right? And that portal is going to be really, I mean, today we have these we have these five videos and we have a number of documents, okay, that you're going to use for the trust. You can always go in there and access those documents in that. We'll be continuing to add additional documents into that portal and other videos in that portal. So we'll be enhancing that and providing more information. So this is a portal for them from an education perspective and from a uh, resource support pers perspective right. for them to use. So now they've done the application and they've been receiving these series of emails, right? We went over the becoming the bank email. Uh, they're going to receive the email about the funds received. Um, and at this point, they've now gone through the five training videos. Well, by now, they should have received the trust in the mail. FedEx, yeah. right? Yes. We second day air that. Yep. Absolutely. And now it is time to activate the trust. That's right. Right. So they're going to need to meet with the settler to sign forms. Where do you recommend doing that? I know some people go to UPS store or different, but I know you've activated a lot of trust for a lot of clients. What works best and what is most convenient? Um, and what do you recommend? What I recommend and I found to be the most convenient is you use a bank, okay? So the bank that you want to open a bank account at, that you want to do banking with, um, show up with the settler mm -hmm. and uh, with the trust book, okay, and the documents, um, have photo ID in that with you. Um, then call ahead, set up a time for, for the bank to take and have someone there because they'll provide you all of these services of, you know, doing the notarization free of charge. Mm -hmm. 
So that way, because there's a lot of notaries. I mean, there's several p pages that have to be notarized. So, the you know, it'll take about a half hour probably for the bank to work with you to sign all the different documents. Now, they need to have the EIN as well, right? That's right. Which is something that during this process of them receiving all these emails is something you're doing in the background, right? That's right. I'm, I'm going I'm to get to fill out the application for them from the IRS to get the EIN number for the trust, and I'll be emailing them that letter. Okay. So, again, another reason why they got to have a good email address. Good email, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, to update that with us if it changes, right? Because we're yeah, going to be sending them very the important yes. information about how to right. use their trust. That is correct. And so then while they're at the bank, here's a couple other steps to do is that not only then get, get it initialized and get the, all the documents signed, but then you can set up the bank account. Well, while you're setting up that bank account, one of the things that almost every bank's going to want is they're going to want to make a copy of the corpus of the trust for their records, mm -hmm. okay? Because in that, it, it gives them from their fiduciary responsibility and uh, they're going to know that the type of trust it is and that it, what rights it has, like to own property and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So they'll want a copy of the corpus of the trust. Well, when they're doing that, almost all these banks have copiers that when they copy that, they can save it to a PDF. So now you've got all the documents signed and you're with the bank, just ask them when you make a copy of it, will you save it to a PDF and, and email it to me or give me a copy of uh, the PDF? So now you got a copy, on, uh, you know, PDF copy of the trust with all the signatures on it, which you can use down the road in a lot of ways. Awesome. <clears throat> so now concluding the activation emails, the last email that they're going to get is going to talk about the accounting service that um, right now comes with the trust. That's correct. And it's going to outline kind of, um, number one, how to contact them. Yeah, it's going to... What information that they need. And it's also going to talk about um, what services that they're going to be provided for that first calendar year, right? That is correct. So the um, first thing is these services are on a calendar year. So, you know, if you today, you know, say it's in July, okay, and you got the trust, then that service is from July to, to January, the end of the year. To the end of the year. Um, includes the filing of all the tax It's basically a tax year. Else. Yeah, it's a tax year kind of thing. I mean, so all of the, all the tax you know, the forms will be filled out for that year, that whole year for you and that you'll get consulting. So the um, accountant provides consulting on the trust, on how to use a trust, putting assets, buying, selling assets, structuring a deal and, and how to use the trust to optimize it for any particular business deal or investment deal you're doing, right? Questions on that. Accounting questions on how to handle accounting issues around the trust. He will answer all those. All that consulting is included in there. So to um, truly get the value out of the trust, they really need to utilize that service. Absolutely. By getting in contact with the accountant, giving them a call if they have questions, um, if they need to, to figure out how to fill out a form properly or they have a question about a form. Yep. That's what that service is for, right? Exactly right. Or and if they're going to structure a deal within the trust and they just want to run, because we provide a lot of that in our video training. Yes. But if they just want to run something by, that's what the accountant is there for, right? Right. Is, is just to make sure that they're that that they're doing things the right way. Because once they learn how to do it, they know how to do it forever now. Yeah, that's exactly so right. And I would say the first year mm -hmm. really is when they want to use that the most. Yes. Right. Yeah. And it's not like we don't provide anymore. I mean, we still provide service that for our clients and that on there too, but it's good for the accountant to know what kinds of transactions you're doing and making sure they're done right, right from an accounting perspective. Yep. I'm not an accountant, but... Uh, well, I know our goal as a company yeah. is that we provide enough training to the client that they don't ever need to call, right? right? Where they're just using the accountant to file the return at the end of That's the day. Right. But yeah. that being said, the accountant is there and has, yes. you know, 20, 30, 30 years experience? 31 years experience with this trust, filed over 10,000 tax returns. Never had an audit, never had a request Zero for Zero audits. That's right. It's absolutely amazing. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a valuable service. And that it's you're going to learn a lot from them on, you know, interacting with them. And so it's got, good to know they're there if you need them because... Yeah, and we've got a lot of very... We have some very sophisticated clients that are doing some very sophisticated things from investments and that. And, um, you know, so that there's you know, having that resource there and how to do some of these more sophisticated structures in that is, is important. Sure. Well, thanks for going over this with you me. You bet. Craig. Absolutely. We're really excited for our clients and 
uh, they're in good hands. Awesome. All right. Thank you. You bet. All right, Craig. So the client has received their trust now. Let's talk a little bit about how the trust works. Yes. Now, the first thing is the trust is based on contract law or constitutional law. What does that mean? Absolutely. So the huge differentiator of this trust is that it's based on contract constitutional law and not legislative law. Our constitution tied to the constitution is common contract law and it holds it sacred that you and I or individuals can enter into a contract and nobody can interfere with that. Not the, not the legislature, other laws, whatever, it holds that sacred. And that's how it's structured is with that. Legislative law, it's a creature of the legislature and the Bar Association. They create all these other, other laws. And the Supreme Court has upheld that since 1911 that all contract law is not subject to the rules and regulations of the legislature. Now to clarify though, that doesn't mean you can break the law. No, that's exactly right. It doesn't, it doesn't allow you to supersede legislative law as far as like committing fraud or something no, like that. No. I want to make sure people are clear right. that our trust does not allow you to break no. the law or do anything against the law. But it can do a lot of things um, from how it treats assets, how it treats expenses right. and that. And, you know, like, like, for instance, if I'm doing real estate, I don't have to do a 1031 exchange. I don't have to do that. It's, it's, a lot of these rules and regulations don't apply to the contract law. Now, it is true <clears throat> also that the IRS cannot even legally tax entities that it did not create. That is true. There's been a ruling on there that, they, that the Supreme Court said that, um, you know, on a contract law basis, the legislature cannot regulate or tax an entity it did not create. It was not party to the creation of the contract. Um, though we file 1041s, we follow the, the IRC code 643 compliant with that, the extraordinary dividends and everything else, so we're all straight. But an example that. of a creature of legislature would be like a LLC or a C Corp or that something exactly like that. That's exactly right. All those were created by the legislature. They have dominion over those. Um, they can regulate them. They can change the regulations. They do all the time. It's right. a moving target. Um, it's not the case with ours. And, and there's all this upkeep that has to happen with all of those things created by the legislature. I mean, you have to conform with yearly reports and meeting notes and fees and that. There's none of that with this trust. This trust there's, is, is good in all 50 states. Mm. It does not have to have any filing with any state. Uh, there's all the thing to keep this trust enacted is that every 21 years there's a form in the trust book that you will pull out of the trust book, you'll sign and get notarized, and that reinstates the trust for another 21 years. You put that form back in the trust, you don't have to file it anywhere, but if a court or an entity asked you to prove that the trust was enacted, you could just pull that form and show them and mm -hmm. then put it back in the trust. So the trust could last forever? Forever, yes. Let's talk a little bit mm -hmm. about selling all your assets to the trust. People ask me a lot, um, what do I sell it for? If I'm selling my, for example, my personal residence into my trust, how do I decide what I'm gonna sell it for? Yes. Yeah, so in all situations, when you're selling your assets to the trust, you're always gonna sell them at your cost, minus any depreciation that was taken, plus any improvements that you made to that asset. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is, is that we're not, we do not wanna create a capital gains event in the sale of that asset to the trust. If you were to sell it to the trust for more than what your cost minus depreciation plus improvements would be, you would have gain. That creates a profit. Creates a profit, you'd have capital gains on that. Mm -hmm. On that, We don't wanna create the capital gains. So that goes into the trust. Anytime you sell an asset into the trust, each person in the trust, the trustees, beneficiaries, and that are gonna have a chart of account number and that we call a promissory note. And so the value of that, of that transfer is going to be registered in that promissory note. So now the trust owes them for that money. One other thing I will add here is that, so if I have a house, for instance, and I have, I take my cost, my depreciation plus improvements, I make a, I do a warranty deed or a quick claim deed, and I do a bill of sale on it. <clears throat> I'm also gonna do a note transfer. If I have a mortgage against that, we have a form for a note transfer, a note tra assignment form, to where we assign that note to the trust. 
Um, and now the trust is going to make the payments on that house, okay, and such. So it's assuming that note. So the actual what goes on the promissory note will be the cost that you sold it for minus what the note is for, and then that would be the value that you would you would have as far as an asset <clears throat> on the promissory note value that you can draw against. Right. Now sometimes I see people wait to move assets into the trust. I mean, I've actually seen some clients, believe it or not, wait a year before they move assets into the trust. Isn't yeah. one of the biggest benefits of doing this the fact that once I sell an asset to the trust, that it's no longer a personal expense to me anymore. Meaning if I sell my personal residence to the trust, right, I may pay some rent as the trustee, but I don't own the house anymore, which means if the water heater breaks or the you know, I got to pay a gardener. Aren't those now trust expenses? They're trust expenses now. Exactly right. And the value of trust expenses is that the nature of the trust, all the money that's coming into the trust is going to be tax deferred money. Okay. Unless you put money in there, you already paid taxes on, but it's going to be tax deferred money. So now the trust is paying for all those expenses with tax deferred money and never going to have to pay taxes. So tax people money. set up LLCs <laughs> to get tax benefits, <clears throat> right? right? Meaning... I'm an entrepreneur, I'm making a lot of money now, my accountant's gonna tell me to go set up a corporation so right. that I can get tax deductions, right? right. Business write-offs. That's right. Our trust is so much more powerful because if I don't own any of the assets anymore, like my cars, right. need an oil change, things like that, tires on the car, if I don't own it, I'm not obligated to pay for it personally. That's right. The trust can now pay for all those exactly things, right. right? With tax deferred money. Exactly right. And so the tr everything, all your personal expenses, you know, now become trust expenses. The only thing the trust cannot expense is what we call the three F's, food, fun, and fashion. And for beneficiaries who are 21 years or younger, all their food and all their fashion is an expense to the trust. Mm. If you had someone in the family who or a child that had autism or who had any any type of disability or whatever, then the trust can can pay for all their expenses, including food and fashion, that for the, for as long as they have that disability or whatever in the wow. trust, and it's all an expense to the trust. Yep. So it's important to uh, understand that, and so that, yes, you want to get your assets into the trust because um, I just re we just recently had a client that um, had on the trust for a while and had moved all his assets in there, had moved some. And uh, it, one of his assets that hadn't been in the trust uh, became attacked. And uh, if he would have had it in the trust, there's nothing they could have done. Mm -hmm. And all it would have meant was him just filling out a bill of sale and getting into the trust, and that issue wouldn't be there now. So, so now let's say I want to take my wife on a vacation. Right. Obviously, that's a personal <clears throat> expense. That's right. How would I get that money out of the trust? Do I have to pay taxes on it? I know you mentioned the promissory note. I know the answer, but right, yeah, I want you to answer yeah. it for the people that are watching the video. A absolutely. So, when you have that promissory note of all the assets you sell in there now, if you want, um, so let's say you've got a million dollar promissory note in the trust, mm -hmm. and you want uh, ten thousand dollars for food, fun, and fashion, you can pull ten thousand dollars out of the trust. It's tax free. And it's just going to reduce that promissory note from a million to nine hundred ninety thousand. Okay. So basically, I'm deducting off of money that is owed to me by the trust versus making a distribution. Exactly right. Which is the only thing that really creates a taxable event with this trust. That is, is correct. If money is distributed, right? Because then it's going to another entity, right? Now, if it's going right. to another trust, it would still have a tax benefit, but if it was right. going to an individual or it's distributed right. to, to partners or LLCs or whatever, then that money would be taxed according to wherever it was distributed to, right? right? Whoever whoever received the money. So the promissory note is really the key to the whole deal. It is. It absolutely is. And, you know, and usually most people never run it, never run out on that promissory sure. note. I mean, our accountant has been working with this for 31 years, has never had a client who's ever exhausted their promissory note yet in a trust So, uh, for food, fund, and fashion. And the other thing is, is that a lot of our clients, for instance, are real estate investors. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to go on trips where they're going to be the primary thing they're doing on that trip is looking at real estate to invest in. You just document that. It becomes a business expense to the trust because that is a business that the beneficial trust can do is investing in real estate in that. And so now the food, the fun you've had on that is a uh, 
you know, it's the expense to the trust. Now, one of the sayings we say a lot is that when it comes to asset protection, the trust is a titanium vault. That is correct. What do we mean when we say that? What I mean is that nothing, and I mean nothing, absolutely nothing can penetrate this trust. As an example, no court turnover order, never been, no court turnover order has ever been issued against this trust, and as far as we can tell, in 489 years. Um, no government agency. We've had, cl we've had clients, our accountants had clients where, you know, they own farm and ranch land. The EPA shows up on their doorstep, say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you got some land down here in the South 40, we've been looking at it, we've analyzed it, and it falls within the wetlands provision of, of issues with there, so we're going to claim that land. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, not on this land, you're not. This land sits in a spendthrift contract law trust, and here's the documentation. I think you ought to go talk to your attorneys, and we can talk then. And they come back and they say, sir, you're right, we talked to our attorneys, we're sorry we, uh, you know, wasted your time, and uh, have a nice day. I bet you that man felt really powerful in that moment. You bet he does. Going you know, up against the federal government yeah. and having a trust that yes. can protect you like that? There's no other vehicle, none, that will give that level of protection. Eminent domain, same thing. You got a house, you got a house and some land and they want to kind of, now the county wants to put a road across the land and they want to, they're showing up and saying, you know, hey, we'll buy this land for you, here's what we'll give you for it. And he says, well, I'm not going to take that kind of money for it. I mean, it's worth a lot more. And besides, I don't want splitting my, my land in half, you know. And I says, well, I, I understand, but we'll just use eminent domain and you'll be forced you to have to take what we want to offer for you. And you're saying, not in this situation, you're not. This land's owned by a trust, you can't do it, here's the information, go check with your attorneys. And we've had, we've had numerous clients that have been protected with them in the domain. And, you know, some of them decide, you know, I don't want that at any price. I don't want to split my land up, and they have that right. Others have said, okay, well, I'll let it go through there, but this land's worth a lot more than what you're doing. We have one client that got 16 and a half times more per square foot for his land because of his trust than his neighbors did. That is a perfect example of a titanium vault. That is a great, yes. And you know, and here's the thing that people, people get lured a lot about the tax benefit of the trust. And, it, and it's a great, it's a great benefit. But I, you know, our accountant, when I was talking with him, he's been working for 31 years, I asked him early on, I said, if I was gonna interview all your clients and have this trust, and what, you know, and ask them what is the greatest value of the trust, what would they say? And I thought, well, you know, you being an accountant, you know, you're gonna surely right, say, right. you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be the tax benefit. Sure. And he said, Craig, he says, overwhelmingly, it would be asset protection. All these people have had assets in that. They've all been challenged at one time or another. The peace of mind knowing that no matter what happens, any type of accident or people fall on something or a car accident or anything, nobody can sue, can penetrate this trust in any way, shape, or form. A lawsuit could wipe out everything that you've done. Yeah. I mean, just yes, like that. exactly like that. And it's happened to so many people. I mean, you know, there's over 101 million tr lawsuits filed in the United States last year. That's almost one for every, you know, man, woman, and child. That's like, you know, one. Kind of sounds like a business. <laughs> it is a business. Yeah, it's a right. It is a deal, and so you can't penetrate the trust. It's protected, um, and that is that level of protection. You, that level of peace of mind. Right. You you can't put a price tag on. Especially when you work so hard. I mean, as parents, we work so hard to provide for our kids and and create a legacy. Well, to be able to have that legacy sitting inside of this trust, I mean, it just, at least for me, it provides a tremendous amount of peace of mind. And just, and again, thinking about like, you know, fam you know, generation after generation after generation, and at all of these assets, you know, land and buildings and business and intellectual property or whatever has been able to be transferred with no inheritance tax, no probate, no nothing, okay? It doesn't miss a beat. There's no fighting over anything, okay? A successor trustee just steps into play in the role, okay? And it carries on and carries on. And, and, and as all of the different growth in the family occurs, they all become part of the trust and get blessed by it. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great thing. So lastly, let's just talk about the differences between both trusts, the beneficial trust has asset protection, you can defer passive income, K-1 income and capital gains, um, active income, what about that in the beneficial trust? Right, so the primary deal, that the all of the tax benefit lies within the beneficial trust. Even if you were to go like a business trust, I mean, it all flows down to the beneficial trust because 
it is compliant with IRC 643. It's a discretionary trust, and because it's stress discretionary, it has to be a discretionary trust to be compliant with IRC 643. So anybody doing real estate investing or crypto or stocks, bonds, or any type of thing that's an investment activity that's producing passive income, K-1 distributions, or capital gains from the sale of those assets, all that is covered in the beneficial trust. And, and the beneficial trust all. is also discretionary Yes. And there's no probate or inheritance taxes, right? None, none whatsoever on it at all. And so, but then there's people that have active income. They may have, you know, they have a business that, you know, that they've got active income coming from, right? Mm -hmm. And so the trust can, there's a couple ways the trust can deal with that. One is that, um, let's say they may be a realtor um, or a broker, real estate broker, let's say. And so they have an LLC and they have that license tied to the LLC because that profe all professional licenses have to be held in an LLC mm -hmm. or uh, an entity such as that corporation or individually. So by putting an LLC and having it in there, now the structure we can do is that the trust, because of the nature of the structure of the LLC, the trust can be a 90% limited partner mm -hmm. with that LLC. And then, so there's two things we do in this, is that we take the assets of that LLC, whether they be tangible or intangible assets, mm -hmm. and we sell them to the trust. And when you say, in a lot of times, in a lot of businesses, the vast of what the value is, is the intangible. It's client databases. It's strategic relationships that you spent your lifetime developing. Email lists. Email lists, um, systems, processes, software, um, you know instruction manuals yeah all that type of stuff mm -hmm. right I mean those those are all intellectual capital and they're they're intangibles but they're really where the value is sure so now as they're in the trust they're protected nobody can attack those but second of all the beneficial trust now can lease those assets to the LLC that it needs to conduct that business mm -hmm. that lease can be established for up to 70 percent of the net income for the prior period of that business, that LLC business. So now what we're doing is we're the, the LLC is establishing an expense to pay that lease, so that's an expense for the LLC. That lease payment to the trust is passive income to the trust. Mm. So now we've taken and converted active income into passive income. And that's that gets, all with the beneficial that, trust. With the beneficial trust, and it gets deferred for in perpetuity within the beneficial trust using the extraordinary dividend in the trust structure. So that is, you know, huge. Now we've got 30% left. Now here's where it gets really exciting is that that 30% that's left in there, the trust is a 90% limited partner mm. in that LLC. So 90% of that 30% is gonna get distributed to the back trust. to the trust via a K-1 distribution. Mm. And that K-1 distribution to the beneficial trust is passive income, and that trust is gonna defer that for in perpetuity within the trust. So that leaves me 3% of the whole, or 10% of that 30% that the trust, that the LLC now is gonna have to pay taxes on. And a lot of times, that's below the threshold to have to pay any tax. Wow. So it, that is huge from a tax benefit. Now. Um, all of that can happen in that business. That business can be producing any type of active income, and we can use that structure in an LLC to do that. But what about a business trust, though? Yes. Because so, I know I know you can do that with the beneficial trust. Yes. And maybe if they're not making a lot of money, maybe that's the better option. Right. But if somebody has a large business, a lot of a lot to lose, right? Because that's yeah. really what it comes down to is that. With the LLC there, you still have that liability. Yes. Right? They can't. What is, what is the benefit of somebody purchasing a business trust and, say, and, and taking that structure instead and foregoing the LLC? Absolutely. It's a great question. We get this a lot, Josh. And the, um, so the LLC, while it works a lot for, for the smaller businesses and certain things, we have a license tied to it, it has one big vulnerability. And that is, um, since all the assets are in the beneficial trust, nobody can attack the assets and can't get them. Right. But let's say it got sued, the LLC could get a judgment against it for future earnings, and they could attach future earnings in the LLC, and that would not be good. In the business trust, it has um, these benefits. One is that 
it cannot be attacked in any way, shape, or form. No one can attack future earnings in that business on any level. It's got the highest level of penetration. Mm -hmm. um, and it's based on contract common law as well, okay, constitutional law. So you, both your trust and all your entities now are sitting on that side of the fence. With the LLC, you've got like one fence and one foot in the you know, contract constitutional law. law and then one in the legislative law. So, yep. And the other thing about the business trust is that the business trust can handle um, a lot larger business. The lease back amount of money could be in the millions, mm. okay, or hundreds of millions if need be, okay, and it's not going to get scrutiny by the IRS or whatever. It's going to be, be tighter. The asset protection is better. Nothing can penetrate it. So if to a business owner, you would say the business trust is going to give you the maximum it's going to give you asset the maximum. protection There's, for your business. Yes. And another aspect is that let's say you got let's say you have a business, you have partners, okay? Doing partners and distribution of funds in the LLC, working with the trust to maximize the, the benefit for you from a tax perspective in the trust, it's hairy in an LLC mm. because of how the trust has to be making the payments on the asset and has to own the asset to be able to get a benefit and has to be making payments on it. It gets, it gets, it gets a little hairy in the structure of that and it, and it can get messy. With the business trust, it's real simple. And the business trust, you can have as many properties, many businesses as you want, many different types of uh, structures of um, investors in that. And what happens is that the tr business trust is always going to own that asset as far as property. There's other assets that of your personal ones you can put in the business in the beneficial trust and still do a lease back deal. Right. But you're going to have you know properties in the trust it owns, and then the people who invest in that, they're going to become beneficiaries of that business trust, and you're going to have an operating agreement within the business trust that specifies how the distri distribution of profits happen within that property or that investment or that business and how expenses in that are handled. So the operating agreement spells that out. Each one of the investors now are, you know, are, let's say, partners. Those investors become beneficiaries, and that's how those funds distributed. Now, if all those investors were real smart, they'd all have beneficial trust and make those beneficial trust beneficiaries. Because then when the, the money is trust. distributed from the business trust, it's, all it's passive going... Income. That, right, exactly. and, now, and now they're not going to pay any tax. Versus anything. if it went to them as an individual or an LLC... Then they're taxed at the regular levels, They're yes. taxed at the regular levels. And they, have a, and they all have additional asset protection and everything else. So sure. those, are the, those are the real str benefits of the business trust. So lastly, when it comes to selling assets actually into the trust, Let's say I am currently a real estate investor and I currently have properties in my name. I currently have some properties maybe in an LLC name. What is the process, especially if I, because a lot of my clients, they own a lot of, you know, LLCs. Yes. Um, and they've got different properties or JV partnerships in each different one. Yep. What's the process of selling those assets now? to the trust, do I have to, can I sell them right into the trust or is there something else I gotta do first? Yeah, you can't sell them directly into the trust. And um, so the process you have to do is you always have to take that asset from the LLC or the corporation or whatever entity it is, and you need to sell it from that entity to you first. You, let's say, being the trustee, okay, okay the trust. And that's gonna be sold again for cost, minus any depreciation, plus any improvements. So same as we talked about same before. we talked about. If you had a business, okay, best way to do that would be to take your financials, look at your depreciation schedule. It's going to list all your assets. It's going to show what the depreciation is, what the cost base is. It's going to show what owner equity is, okay, mm -hmm. and the thing. And then you're going to sell that in a bill of sale, and it's going to offset the owner's equity in the thing, and so now all the assets, be, you know, come to you. Now, once it's to you, you're going to do a bill of sale selling it from you into the trust for the same amount of money, same same list of bill of sale and the assets and whatever, whether it be property or whatever. If it's got a warranty deed, then you would create a warranty deed going from you to them that you had doing moving it from So really the, the process is just happening twice. It's happening twice. It's, sell it it's the, the trust. same process, right? same price going from the LLC to me, the individual. Right being the trustee, and, and then for me to the trust. Yeah, and there's, absolutely, there's a couple of reasons for that, but one of the biggest reasons is that when you do that bill of sale and you sell it in the trust, that's creating a promissory note in your name. If the LLC 
sold the asset to the trust, then that promissory note would be to the LLC. Okay, and now you wouldn't have access to it. The LLC would have access to it, and then it, LLC could be subject to tax on. Mm. So that you you need to have it come to you, and then you to the trust, and then to get the benefit of the promissory note value in that thing that you can pull against through the rest of your life on the trust. This is why it's important that IWS includes the accountant. Absolutely. Because if people, I mean, even if they're watching these videos, the first calendar year, it would probably be in everybody's best interest. At least I did when I was a new client. Right. I would be calling them all the time for the first time that I do anything, just to make sure even if I'm calling them for 10 seconds to say, hey, is this form proper, right? Or or even reaching out to you as the senior trust strategist, yes. just knowing they have a team of people that they can talk they to, just to make sure they're doing it right the first time. Because I see a lot of people, the mistake they make is they come in, they don't watch the videos, they don't learn how to fill the forms out, and they just kind of wing it, right? A lot of times in life we do things without following direct, especially guys, right? We don't yeah. read the instructions. <laughs> and they might just go fill out a bill of sale, stick that in the trust, and then maybe they get sued down the road and that was property right. and they needed to do a warranty deed. Like they, they right. really need to make sure that that first year they utilize our service and the support that we offer. And by doing that, they're gonna learn this trust and how to do these documents and they'll be able to do it forever. themselves forever. Right? And then they teach that to their kin and, right. and, and it another, goes and on it, for generations. Yeah, and another value of this is that since it's not you know subject to all the rules and regulations of the legislature, it's not a moving target field all the time. Right. You know, once you learn how to do something, it's going to be done the same way. You know, years and years and years down the road, it's not changing. And so, um, and it's a lot simpler than I mean, because of that, it's a lot simpler to operate than a corporation or LLC or whatever. Sure. You just got to learn. You just got to learn. It's just a new, new, new trick. But it's kind of like how the government programmed, really, one generation to rig the whole system, right? They they just yes. got to program one generation on how they want things to work, right? Yes. With their money system. Yep. And then that's your parents and your grandparents who taught you and you yeah. teach your kids and it goes on and on. But now with this trust, people literally have to relearn or like reboot the computer system because they're learning a whole new way of operating outside of the rig system. Absolutely. Very well said. That is, that is so true. And Again, you know, our goal is to continue to add videos like this and build out our learning management system and, and to make accessible, you know, we're an education organization to uh, train people more and more, give more depth, cover in depth all the different forms and everything else. So sure. they'll have a good reference point to come to. So the last thing I want to cover real quick is, and again, people have just gotten their trust now and we're learning yep. how it works. How important is it for people to get I'd say their most important assets in their first, right? Like example yes. would be their personal home, uh, vehicles, stock portfolios, investments, really anything that could come up in a lawsuit, right? Would be really yes. be the first things you would want to get in there right away, right? Because well, then they're want, getting that asset protection. You want to get, yeah, there's two things. One, you want to get asset protection. That's key on those assets. But the other thing is the tax benefit. I mean, if I have a start stock portfolio and I'm producing passive income off from it in, in capital gains, I want to have that transferred as, as soon as possible. So you're saying just because I have the trust doesn't mean the tax benefit starts then? No. Because I think a lot of people think, hey, right. I received my trust right. and now I have all yeah. this tax benefit. Right. Again, the, the foundation of the trust is the trust has to physically own that asset and it's time sensitive. So sooner it owns that data, that trust that's on there, it's documented by a bill of sale that's notarized or whatever, okay? Now it providing the financial tax benefit from that date on and asset protection from that date on. So it you're can't, saying I can't backdate this? Can't backdate, there's no backdating. So I can't like buy a business trust today and go all the way back to last year? No, there's there are some things we can do because it depends on the structure of the business. Um, and, and how income flows in that on there, you can get a little bit of leeway on there and a little bit of benefit, right? And we can consult with, with Rick, our accountant on that, you know, depending upon um, the nature of the business and that. Sometimes a little bit of leeway on there, but it's not, you, you just need to know, you, need, you want to take action now and get right. it in there now.
The sooner it's in there, the sooner you get the benefit. Exactly right. Awesome. Well, I think this is valuable information for everybody, so thanks for taking the time. Thank you. You bet, Josh. Thanks.